Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast, where we learn about the latest ideas and concepts about Sargassum. This podcast is funded by the Resilience, Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity Program, Resenbit. It's financed under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program. Resenbit is being implemented by expertise grants, with primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean Overseas Countries. Let's get ready to learn together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm very excited to have a podcast again with Jenna and Paola. And Paola, you've, you've had some interesting things happening. Where are you now and what's happening in your life? A lot of things, yeah. <laughs> right now I'm in Costa Rica. I'm again in the North Pacific, but in a different community. So we are working with a project with the University of Costa Rica, cultivating algae with the community. So we are making the tests. We are putting some algae in the structures and trying to see if they grow. And yeah, this is the goal for this year. And at the same time, <laughs> I'm finishing my master's so i'm going to defend my thesis on at the end of september so that's mostly that <laughs> that everything that i'm doing right now that's very cool that's exciting um, yeah i have some news as well so as you both know evelyn and i and our listeners know evelyn from the podcast as well um, as part of the grant that the podcast is um, supported by now, the ResinBit grant, we are making a course about Sargassum, an online course for people from different islands in the overseas Caribbean territories um, to learn about Sargassum and really become a champion to educate their local community and also create a network between them where they can exchange ideas and exchange knowledge about how things are on their islands. And um, we, we put out the information, we advertise the course, and we, we have 20 spots to give away. And we actually got 47 people interested in taking the course. So currently we, we made a selection of the, the 20 people that we think are most suited to take the course in terms of learning something new and also in terms of actually bringing that knowledge to their communities. And now we are just finalizing to find out who all can make the dates. And it's very exciting. It will all happen in August. So likely by the time our listeners listen to this, the course is already underway or has happened. Yeah, that sounds amazing. You have been working on that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, what a great response. That's really exciting. Now you know if this is a success and it turns out, you know, to be useful for people, you have a lot more interest mm -hmm. for another session at some point. Yes, I hope we can get another session financed somehow. With all the prep work we've done, it will definitely be a lot cheaper. So, but I want to introduce our guests we have today instead of us just talking about our own lives the whole time. Um, today's guests are actually two good friends of mine from Bonaire. So I know them from the time I've been on Bonaire. Um, Sabine Engels uh, grew up in Curaçao, which is also another island in the Dutch Caribbean. And she spent a lot of time in and around the water, snorkeling, sailing and exploring. Then after high school, she went off to Rijks University in Utrecht for marine biology. And her study and interests have taken her abroad to Brazil, Suriname, India, Sri Lanka, Niger, um, to finally more or less settle on Bonaire, where she has been involved in reef research and ecological studies in Lac Bay. And on Bonaire, she has worked on different projects for Sinapa. And now she and the mangrove maniac volunteers work on mangrove restoration in Bonaire. Um, Jessica Johnson, who is um, joining her, has a master's degree in marine and coastal ecosystems from the Universidade do Algarve in Portugal and has been on Bonaire since 2018. There she worked for the Institute for Sustainable Technology and SINAPA 
and currently she is the director of the environmental science consult consultancy Coastal Dynamics. And both of them, Sabine and Jessica, are co-founders of the Tropical Restoration Network. I'm super excited to have you guys here and to catch up with you guys on how things are in Bonaire. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's really good to see you again. Welcome, everyone. So we are going to start with our first question. This is a question that we asked to all our guests. And what is sargassum to you? Um, I'll answer first. Sargassum for me is a, is a nice brown algae. When I have it in my hands and I see all the little critters on it and under my microscope, but when I see it floating in into uh, the base and on the coast, it also no, it's, um, I know we will have a lot of work and it will be a headache and it will cause a lot of damage. And that's um, so all in all for me, sargassum is, uh, is a huge problem for our nature and we are still trying to handle it, see if we can do something with the sargassum, but so far it uh, causes a lot of damage. Yeah, okay, I'll, um, I'll see if I can follow that. I echo exactly what she's saying. Uh, actually, I didn't know what sargasm was um, until I moved to Bonaire because this isn't something I've ever come across before. And so my introduction to it was kind of like taking water out of a fire hose. It was all of a sudden there was this huge influx of this brown seaweed on the beaches that was just killing everything. So it was almost like a horror movie of this, like just it kept coming and coming and coming. Um, but since then, actually, it's become uh, maybe a, a point of opportunity. Uh, it's it's deadly to the to the environment. It's it's quite scary, actually. The the quantities we get, which although are are small when you see them written down on paper, but because we're such a small island, it is completely overwhelming. But there is potential there. So when you see this, you have to think like there must be something we can do with this sargasm. It can't just be. Uh, only bad. So that's something that a lot of different people are working on. They still haven't quite cracked it. Um, I know for us, it's quite difficult because of the of where our sargasm comes from. It doesn't come from the Sargasso Sea like it does in the north. Uh, so our sargasm is a bit different. Uh, but yeah, I see it as an as a opportunity to, to try to, to figure out this mystery and find something useful to do with it. Yeah, I love that thread is very common when we interview people. It's a problem, but also an opportunity. And that is the best way to look at something that's a problem as possibility, you know, for endless opportunities, really. Um, how is Bonaire impacted and, and for how long um, has it been impacted? Do you know, are there particular years that have gone by? Is it a seasonal thing? Are there months during the year that are worse um, or sections of Bonaire, different bays? that are worse or more impacted? Okay, let me, I've been here longer so I can answer that. Um, it always has been coming to Bonaire but in such small quantities that most of the people didn't know what it was. And then in 2015, we had uh, the first uh, big influx and it was in a small bay in the north, um, in the corner of uh, Bonaire Lagoon, and that bay always gets uh, uh, comparatively the, the most. And it was at that time a huge problem because it blocked everything and they worked on it, but it was just a small group working on it. So most people still didn't know about it, but they noticed the smell when living down, uh, down the wind. And um, since then it has been coming back over and over again. And in 2016, we had it mixed with uh, oil from Trinidad, there's an oil spill. So that was quite a challenge. And then we had our really big first influx that was not only hitting uh, Lagoon, but also a very large open water bay where we have mangroves and seagrasses and corals. And um, that was devastating. We saw the, the, all the small critters that live in the soil, in the sediments that uh, came floating out and in subsequent uh, influxes we see the same we see again that all those animals living in the sediments coming out but we see that the quantities are less so the sediments didn't have the the time to 
recuperate to recover so it, it it the impact is over time and it's not a funny thing but it's a, um, what was quite remarkable the first time we had it on march 9 and then next year on the same day maybe yeah, jessica and we have been working on it trying to handle it and jessica knows also a lot about this how how we have been struggling to handle the sargassum influxes Yeah, it's an interesting problem. Uh, here on Bonaire, we have kind of different levels of responsibility, whether it's the local government or the park service. And this was something that kind of didn't fit cleanly into one category or the other. And I know you've already uh, talked to Stanop of the park service, so I'm sure you've already heard about this. But that was one of the biggest uh, discussions was, what is this? Is this a problem in the marine park? So the park service should solve it? Or is this like, an actual emergency at a, at a national local level that needs to be handled by the local government. So that uh, just like kind of the boring bureaucracy side of it, it was also quite difficult because it is a really big problem. It's quite expensive to tackle. And then who is responsible for it? So in the end, that has taken us some time, but I think we've made a lot of progress. But in the beginning, and I know, uh, Fran, you know, because you were here for this, it was just citizens with pitchforks and shovels like volunteers pulling it out because there really wasn't an organized response. Now, I'm happy to say this has completely changed. Um, we now have a, a strategy that is mostly uh, mechanized. We don't require so many actual pitchforks in the, in the water, but it is, yeah, it was quite an emergency for a long time and we didn't really know how to handle it. So it was a definite learning experience. Yeah, luckily I actually wasn't there when the first big influx came to Bonaire. I think I was already left, but um, I came back in June or so that year for just a visit. And my friend told me about all about the big pitchforks and everybody pitching in to help. And luckily in Bonaire, there is that culture of if there is a nat nature emergency that a lot of people are there to give a helping hand. So I think even though it must have been scrambled and chaotic, it, it's good that there's a lot of people willing to help. Um, you talked a little bit about this big bay, and I wanna I wanna get a bit more into it. Uh, so this big bay is called Luck Bay, and it's this beautiful bay. It has this natural uh, Acropora coral, so staghorn and elkhorn corals, that is a huge area, and I've never seen it anywhere like this before in the Caribbean and also, as you said, seagrasses and mangroves. And it's also used recreationally for, for windsurfing, etc. cetera. Um, so tell us a bit more about how sargassum affects this bay and how it moves into it and if it can move out of it again or if it really has to be removed to, to get out of the bay. Okay, if you see the form of the bay it's the um, um it's like a, a open bowl with two peninsulas another peninsula yeah but kind of peninsulas and uh, with all the eastern wind and the currents everything comes in from the east but the northern part is a little bit more protected from sargassum than the southern part and in the southern part we have the um, also peninsula where most of the windsurf um Operators are are based, so they they feel everything that comes in, and for uh, Bonaire, this is a very important area. The the there's not a residential population living nearby, but for recre recreational, um, it's very important. We have uh, done the statistics on the the importance of this area, and uh, Sorbonne area and Lac Bay are really in the top. Uh, of the people coming to Bonaire to enjoy the sea and the windsurfing. So it's a huge impact at that time on the on those touristic uh, operations when there are uh, people coming from um, cruise boats and they want to enjoy a beach. So a bond is not an option anymore. And um, But we are more and more able to handle it. So. It, it, it gets better and the people are not uh, impacted as much. Fisheries, they, they, they still have the other areas of the bay where they can go. So there's an impact there, but not as big. 
Yeah, I agree with everything Sabine said. Um, Lock Bay is really important um, on all three fronts. So it's it's culturally important because all residents, almost all residents, use this uh, as a recreation. On Sunday, it's really popular to go and have a picnic on the beach, swim in the water. Windsurfing is a really popular local sport here. It's a, it's important environmentally because, like uh, Fran just said, uh, there's 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 a fringing coral reef that's just really important. We have uh, seagrass beds and we have the largest mangrove area in the uh, Dutch Kingdom. The bay itself is really important for sea turtles. Actually, the sea turtles of Lock Bay have a growth rate that's twice that of any place else in the Caribbean. So uh, there's a lot of focus on maintaining the seagrass beds for the turtles because this is important for rebounding turtle numbers. I mean, we could go on and on. This this area is really important and it is kind of the, the way it's positioned. It's just all the sargasm comes right into it. And then the way the water circulates, there's really no way for the sargasm to get pushed out afterwards. So it really needs to be taken out. Um, and that's been the struggle that Bonaire has had to figure out, which I think, yeah, they, we've come a long way, but it it's not perfect yet. Well, the, that's really important because, for example, here when sargassum arrives, people are seeing mostly what happened on the beach. And we are talking about recreational, right? Tourism, that how people don't like it because there's a lot of sargassum on the beaches. But as you mentioned, there's a lot of other ecosystems that are being affected. So you mentioned mangroves. Can you explain us explain us what happened with mangroves when there's an influx of sargassum? When sargassum hits, it's um, it the environment becomes anoxic and uh, it kills everything. And there's a lot of sulfur in the area. And what we've seen um, is that uh, slowly the mangroves die off. So we see a buildup over the years. That um, in the first year we only saw the leaves turn yellow, but but gradually it becomes more and more uh, pronounced that you see really the trees dying, but from the other side, we are very happy that it's in the whole area and uh, they did satellite um, image uh, analysis. It's less than 1% of the whole area that's affected. So if we are get, if improving our technique of removing the sargassum when it hits, it will become better. The only downside is at this moment is uh, once the mangroves are dead, and the area is um, kind of uh, polluted with sargassum, with, with all the materials, and it's um, a high uh, load of eutrophication, then it will take a lot of time to flush everything out of the system and to be able to restore the mangroves. Yeah, maybe one other thing that's interesting to note is the mangroves of uh, Lock Bay are quite interesting because there's only a couple inlet areas where the water comes in from the bay and then flushes to the back. So because of this, actually, we have the ability to physically block off these inlet areas. And we do this by just putting a net across the mangroves. The inlets are maybe, yeah, four to five meters across. So we're able to easily stretch uh, a net out. And that actually, it doesn't keep everything out, but it keeps a lot of the sargasm out. Um, and it just p kind of pushes it further down the bay, um, which is not great for the, the fringy mangrove area, but it does keep it from getting into the network of channels. And I think that has made quite a big difference in the, the back area of the mangroves. And uh, maybe- Just a quick question. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, uh, this net, net is always present or is only in the season when there's sarcasm? Yeah, so we actually keep it like rolled up and tucked in the trees. Um, so we only pull oh, it okay. out when there's sargassum present because we don't want to have like a, a net just always there because this is an important area for uh, fish to come through. And, and although mm -hmm. we've never seen fish caught in the net, there's no need to leave it out oh. most of the time. So and um, that was actually my next yeah, question. <laughs> yeah, we actually we have never seen anything caught in it that I'm aware of. Um, but oh, okay. yeah, so we only out roll it. And, like uh, Sabine said earlier, actually, I thought that we had had sargasm quite like infrequently throughout the year. But before this podcast, I went through and actually wrote down all of the major um, landings. And actually, it's almost always March, April, May. Um, so it, we only have a couple months out of the year where there's significant sargasm. 
So that does make it quite easy for us to put the net out. And then because we go into the mangroves uh, multiple times a week, we're able to quickly, once we see the sargasm is, is slowing down, to pull the net back and, um, and make sure that it, everything can, is free flow. Well, I have to make um, one additional comment that was before Jessica was on the island. We also had an inflex flux in uh, December and January. That was quite strange. And it was just in that one uh, bay where um, most, of, most of the time when there is sargassum, it will hit Lagoon. It's a bay just a little bit north of Lac Bay. And um, second place is uh, Lac Bay that is hit. But usually it's indeed in the period from uh, March, April, May, and then sometimes a little bit later in the year. But uh, this season should be good. You mentioned earlier that um, the, your sargassum doesn't come from the Sargasso Sea. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I missed it, but where, how, how is that happening? Or what, where is your sargassum coming from? Um, there's an area between the northeast of Brazil and Africa, and it's called the Greater Atlantic Sargassum Belt. There's a patch that has been growing since, I think, 2011, and it's getting bigger, bigger and bigger. And patches from that area are, uh, when they break loose and you have those, those sargassum rafts, they float and they hit mostly the southern area of the Caribbean but also they impact uh, Africa where they have it as well. But it's important to note that the, the reason why this is different than the Sargasso Sea is uh, because of how the sargasm has come about. So it is believed that this sargasm that Sabine just mentioned is actually a byproduct of agricultural practices in the Amazon. So excess fertilizers being used along Amazon with heavy rains get washed into the river, then make it out to the sea, and this has caused this algal bloom. So because of that, the sargassum we get from this area is uh, rich in heavy metals. So we actually have done another study where we've used the sargassum, composted it to, make, to use as fertilizer, and we found that even through that process of breaking down the sargassum uh, in the soil, we could still measure uh, significant levels of cadmium and arsenic in vegetables produced by these fruits, so uh, by these plants. So that's the that's the big concern for us with this sargasm is not only is the natural decomposition project process quite difficult, uh, but we also have these heavy metals of cadmium and arsenic that we're concerned about. Sorry, but you're receiving the same morphotypes or from, sarga uh, from the sargassum sea or are different? No, it's the same three uh, morphotypes, the fluitans and the natans and the, um, well, the, the subspecies. And, but sometimes the compositions differ. So once in a while we take it out and we put it on a microscope and we measure the different, um, we measure oh, the wow. species composition. Yeah. And actually, um, most of the people we have on the podcast do receive the sargassum from the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. I think it's only the people in Texas and the Gulf of Mexico that still receive sargassum from the Sargasso Sea, where that sargassum, um, you know, circles through naturally. But the rest of the Caribbean or the wider Caribbean and Africa do get the sargassum from the Great Atlantic Belt. And when it comes, as, as um, Jessica said, when it comes past Brazil, um, it does... Um, somewhere in these areas, it does pick up heavy metals. I'm not sure if Africa also has a problem with the heavy metals or if it's yeah. just the wider Caribbean. But what, what Jessica and um, Sabine just said about uh, the difficulties with the, with the heavy metals is, is um, valid for most of the wider Caribbean and the sargassum count there. Yeah, it's just it's really important to keep like repeating this because I know that there were some studies done that showed that sargassum could be composted and used as uh, animal fodder. I know that was like a popular practice in the North Caribbean. And so that was something that was spreading very quickly here on Bonaire, at least the idea that, OK, well, maybe we don't use it for humans, but maybe we can use it for goats or donkeys. And we are just really trying to, to press into people's minds that this is not safe to be consumed, uh, even for animals. 
um, maybe even even more so for animals because this is the only thing they're going to be eating during that season. So um, yeah, it's just really important that that we that we stress that there has been a, a shift. So even though maybe in the a decade ago this might have been more suitable, uh, it's no longer safe to to be consumed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. That is a very important fact, and it's unfortunate because it makes it much more difficult to use as a post, you know, product and anything. So um, I also wanted to ask you, in addition to the mangroves, what happens to the seagrass beds um, when there is an influx present? How are, how are the seagrass beds being affected? I know there's a lot of my, uh, marine organisms, including turtles, but even smaller organisms that rely on seagrass beds as well. So. Well, um, then what we have seen in the area that is directly impacted, it um, the seagrass dies, and I've been uh, monitoring it, and we so we swam along the area, and we see that the seagrass has come back. But before the seagrass come back, it's mostly the 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 marine algae that that comes back, and the seagrass stays a, a little bit off. And there are other areas that have been impacted by uh, the sludge of the decomposing sargassum that um, covers the bottom. But it's the situation is improving. The only concern that is still lasting is that there's the heavy load of uh, organic material in the bay, and we see blooms of uh, other alga that um, take over the seagrass beds. Yeah, so we have issues with degrading water quality during sargasm decomposition. We have a problem with uh, the sargasm actually smothering the seagrass, so like physically killing the seagrass. And then we also have the, the problem with the removal process of the sargasm is still very much done from the beach. So this removal of the sargasm, you have trampling of the seagrass in the near shore environment. You have a loss of sand on the beach, which then has its... All, that affects the sediment dynamics of the area. So yeah, so it's not just the water quality, but it's also the physical damage and then, yeah, the impacts of the of the marine life that are there. And then we do have a, an additional threat to the bay of uh, an invasive seagrass. So as soon as we lose these native seagrasses, these uh, invasive seagrasses can come in and take over rather quickly. So that's another thing that, that Sabine has been monitoring as well of, of what is this balance between native and invasive seagrass and then has the sargasm affected this? Wow, that's really interesting. And actually I did a study in the Turks and Caicos Islands on, you know, the loss of seagrass due to mangrove uh due to sargassum. And I saw the same thing. We had brown water, we had those slugs of dead sargassum on on top of the seagrass beds and yeah, we had stumps of seagrass everywhere. But as you said, it, it did come back. Um, first with algae and then seagrass. Luckily, we don't yet. I uh, definitely didn't have back then um, the invasive seagrass, so the native species came back. So that that was a plus. But yeah, it's a, it's a very um, serious on how seagrass beds are infected with um, sargassum, and it does take several years to to come back at least. Um, you already said a bit about um what you're doing with the mangrove maniacs you said you're gonna you're in the mangrove several times a week so tell us a bit more what you do when you know in normal days or normal work days when you don't have to manage sargassum well luckily we don't have uh, sargassum the whole year round but when we um uh, work in mangrove restoration we work mainly on the um, hydrological uh, circulation that needs to to come back because the mangroves tend to clog uh, to block the channels and the mangroves uh, need the fresh seawater coming in. We don't have uh, rivers on Bonaire, so the, the water circulating through the mangroves they, um, rely mainly on or completely on the tidal uh, flows. So we are working on opening the channels and keeping them op open and uh, we have a small staff but we're very happy to have uh, a loyal group of volunteers that uh, come out with us once a week and they help and they make it open. And um, apart from making it open, we have nurseries in the mangrove area where we um, grow the small plants that we can use in degraded areas. 
but we at this moment we use it a lot for planting along the coast so that's um, that's good as coastal protection but they grow very slow but it's also a very a nice way uh, to do outreach to to make people aware of mangroves to tell them about mangroves and that has been very successful and it's um, it's a very nice group of people we have because they support uh, the students when students come and they need some help in the field and when there's a sargassum influx a lot of people show up to help and in reforestation um, projects they come out so it's a nice group that help us uh, work in the mangroves and also in the reforestation and there's also coastal dynamics right uh, jessica you are currently the director of coastal dynamic uh, for what kind of consultancy work could one hire coastal dynamics yeah so one of the reasons that I love Bonaire so much is that it is such a small island and small community that everyone on the island has to wear multiple hats. Um, so what uh, my consultancy does is it, it just provides kind of, I'm a utility player. So if you have a project, you need an extra set of hands, like uh, you can hire Coastal Dynamics to kind of fill that, that void. So right now we have a couple different projects. We support the mangrove maniacs with the, the mangrove restoration in the bay. We support the Park Service. We have a sustainable recreational use project in Lock Bay as well. Uh, this is coral and seagrass restoration, coupled with increased uh, enforcement and communication. So we're really focused on explaining to people the value of this area and trying to increase the overall awareness. And then, uh, yeah, it's uh, we have all sorts of different projects. We also work with... Uh, uh, communicating in scientific research. So there's another organization on Bonaire called the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance. They produce a monthly newsletter, which basically translates uh, more scientific articles into smaller uh, pieces that are more digestible by the public. And so we also help write those articles each month. So yeah, basically so anything you can share. <laughs> so you can share this podcast with them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really important because actually the Dutch Caribbean is, is quite lucky. We do have, well, uh, yeah, there's a, the Dutch Caribbean is kind of a little bit complicated within itself, but within the Dutch Caribbean, we have three islands, which are closely tied to the kingdom of the Netherlands. And we actually are pretty well supported uh, financially from the Dutch government, which does give us the ability to not only conduct our own projects, but also to support research from Dutch universities. So actually we do have a lot of research that's done here, which is really important because it, it gives us the tools we need to actually execute these uh, conservation and restoration projects. So it's, it's really important. Wow, that's amazing. That, that's really interesting because, I mean, the three islands you were talking about is Bonaire, Stacia and Seba. And we, Jenna and I just did an interview with somebody who was talking about a project in Curacao and how hard it is to get funding. Because of course, Curacao is, is in a different state or, or legal state with, with Holland and a bit more removed or with the Netherlands and a bit more removed. And it seems like it does affect funding for, for initiatives. Yeah, and that's actually something, uh, without going too far into it, that is something that uh, we are we are trying to correct. So we're trying to it, trying to press the need that the Dutch Caribbean, which is actually six islands, so you have the three that have the special relationship with the kingdom, plus Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin. We're really trying to press that we need to stay together, the six, and that each of the six needs support. So even though uh, Aruba... Uh, Curacao and Zeman aren't directly under the kingdom the way that uh, Bonaire, Seba, and Stacia are. That that you know that they also have very important environmental areas that need to be supported. And to to honor the fact that because they are a little bit more independent, they don't have access to the the funding the way that uh, that the other three do. So we are trying to press to the to the Dutch government at least the importance of allowing us to free up some money to to support across the six islands. So it's a, it's a work in progress. During the intro, Fran mentioned that both of you are co-founders for the Tropical Restoration Network. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so in 2021, 
we held a workshop on Bonaire uh, to try to bring in experts from around the Caribbean to share knowledge on mangrove restoration. And uh, what we thought would be actually us just being given all this information quickly turned to be everyone kind of looking at each other and being like, yeah, there's a lot of knowledge gaps here. And what we learned during this workshop was that the collaboration within the region was just not there. And that although each of us had a piece of the puzzle, we had never really put it together. So from that, we the there was a common theme where everyone was saying, we really need to communicate more. We really need to work together. Like the problems you have are the same problems we have. Like we should be working on this together. So from that came the idea for the Tropical Restoration Network. Um, we're really excited that this has been funded uh, partially since last year. Um, so that has allowed us to, to kind of organize loosely uh, we have a social media page, we have a website, and in June, as uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, in June, we had our first Tropical Restoration Network workshop in Costa Rica. It was a three-day um, conference where we were able to bring in people from all across the Caribbean. Uh, we did two days of lectures at the University of Costa Rica, and then we did a one-day field trip to the uh, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, where we could see firsthand experiences of their restoration project. And it was completely invaluable because although we are spread over quite a big region, uh, most of the time we have all the same species, all the same issues. So a lot of these, these problems and solutions do translate very well across the projects. So it allows us to, to open up this, this chain of communication to help facilitate some of this. So we're really excited. Our, the website, uh, tropicalrestorationnetwork.com, has a forum where we're really pushing people to put their mangrove and seagrass issues in the forum to help people communicate back and forth with answers. And this is something that we're going to keep pushing over the next uh, couple of years. Did I forget anything, Sabine? Oh, you didn't forget anything, but there's so much to tell <laughs> and maybe not enough time. It's um, we have so far we are still an open uh, network so everybody can join we don't say yes you can or you, you can't and we have all over the caribbean you have all the different um, uh, groupings and we are like open inclusive everybody can join you see sometimes that uh, the, the the british islands tend to be more together with, uh, with some forms of uh, collaboration and then the french islands are different and uh, and also the Dutch islands, we have BCNA, but we try to pull everybody in and, uh, and work together. And I think the exchange is mostly important, so sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, but get, get some small groups together. And uh, funding is, um, is a challenge, but we are working on that, and we hope that it grows more and more and bigger. And some people are really already interested in... Um, having more exchange, uh, reach out to us, or they reach out uh, between themselves. I think it's, um, it's again, another network or effort. We already have the Mangrove um, uh, Action uh, Project. We have the Mangrove uh, Alliance, Global uh, Mangrove Alliance, but this will add to it. This is just a little bit different, and we want to have more work on seagrass in it which is a little bit lagging behind. I forgot something. Oh, but we, we really hope that we can grow. And we have a next workshop in, um, I don't know which uh, month next year, but that will again probably be in Costa Rica. And in that case, also um, SINAC will be involved from Costa Rica and the Mangrove Action Project. So it's nice, it's growing and we want to see it grow more. Very cool. I think Paola will be very excited if you do it again in Costa Rica. And she will definitely yes, try. Definitely. <laughs> it, would be, yeah. it would actually be amazing to have you guys come and represent because sargasm is not a small project problem. Like everyone has this problem. So it would be really helpful yes. to have you guys there to share what you guys have learned through this process. And yeah, it would be really interesting. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. we don't have all the answers on the, um, to sarcasm either, but we do have some, some information on who, who to talk to and a bit on, on what kind of management um, does help. Sometimes it's not um, 
about having all the answers. Sometimes it's about also about the questions that, and then when you learn that everybody has the same question, it's like, hey, we have to look into this and see uh, what you find out in your region and how do you solve this. So that's also uh, a big important part of a network, not only the, the answers, but the questions. That's true. And um, the Tropical Restoration Network, is it a global network or is it um, focused on a specific region? Yeah, we're focused on uh, the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico and Eastern uh, Tropical Pacific. So uh, we're really focused on the region kind of between Mexico to Brazil and then over through Central America and then covering the Caribbean islands. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're, we don't exclude anyone. So actually next month we will be having a webinar that will be on Australian seagrasses. So I think there are a lot of things that translate globally. So we, we invite anyone who has anything that might be able to help in, but we do try to focus on species and problems within uh, yeah, this area. But um, yeah, we're always open to exchange and, and to see what other people have to say. Very cool. Um, Jenna and Paola, do you have any questions? There's a lot of information, but... Yeah, I think we, we all yeah. have a lot of extra questions, but I think in terms of the podcast, I think we may yes. are done asking and, and, um, and frying you with all our questions. So thank you so much. Sabine and Jessica for being on the podcast. I was very much looking forward to finally talk about the impact on mangroves and seagrasses as we haven't really covered that on the podcast yet or very little. And I think it's very important for our listeners to know that it doesn't only affect tourism, but also um, affects really important ecosystems. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us on. Yeah. Your podcast. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. So, what did you guys take away from the interview we just had? Well, I, I, I was excited, and I think this is going to be a very important episode. <laughs> All of the episodes are important, but this one in particular is because, um, a, as as I say during the interview that most of the people see sargassum arriving and something that people bothers is sargassum on the beach, but most of the people don't know what is happening in other ecosystems or sometimes even in the corals, for example, because people are not seeing what is happening there, only people who dive, etc. right? So I really like to talk about what happens in the mangroves in the seabeds also. What about you, Jenna? I, I really liked how they were incorporating the other three islands and trying to kind of like spread the wealth, uh, you know, if I don't know, it sounds like a silly way to put it, but I really liked her idea of just collaborating and growing that space for funding because that's really part of the problem when you're trying to get a project off the ground. And it sounds like they have the finances you know, behind them with their government, they just need to sort of distribute them all over the place instead of just holding them in half of the um, areas that they are right now. So that part I really enjoyed. Yeah, and, you know, Resinbit, mm -hmm. the, the agency that has funded this project for, um, uh, well, Resinbit that is funding the podcast right now they are actually also funding projects in all six of the Dutch Caribbean islands and, and others in the overseas Caribbean territories. So it, it's good that there are some initiatives that are not just in Bonaire, Stacia and Seba and also cover all, all six islands and where collaborative work is done as well because it's so hard in the Caribbean to do collaborative work because so much funding is specifically for specific areas because it comes from the French government, mm -hmm. from the EU, from the Dutch government, from the English government, etc. and cannot be used within the whole region. So the more funding we get that, that can yeah. just be used around the whole region and, and solve the problems with the partners that make the most sense, the better. 
Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed this episode. I think the energy they're bringing to the table, and I mean, that's the energy they bring to the table when they're doing their work as well. Um, hearing about Bonaire and thinking about Lac Bay, which is this amazing area for nature, but also this place where you just go on, uh, where, you, where I have so many good memories of Sundays spent lazing around with my friends in the water, having some beers and, you know, imagining that place being impacted by sargassum and not being able to enjoy it would, yeah. breaks my heart. You know, it's really one of those places that are mm. part of the culture, as they said. And um, I, yeah, it's, Excellent. you know, it's a beautiful place. It's so beautiful there. So um, I'm very happy that they manage a little bit to, to help um, combat the sargassum there. And it's not as bad as it used to be when it first arrived and that there has been so much um, advances there. Yeah. So yeah, I hope our listeners also enjoyed this episode and we um, will have another episode come out in about two weeks and we hope you stay tuned and also listen to that one. And thank you so much for tuning in and um, yeah, thanks to our um, financial support from Resonbit, of course, and that comes through the EU and um, Expertise Francaise, Expertise France, sorry. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, please check our show notes for links and information in our archives. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. The Sargassum Podcast is made possible through funding by the Resilient Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity Program, Resembi. Finance under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program. Resembit is being implemented by Expertise France with the primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories. The podcast is produced by Paola Diaz, Mario Garcia Rodriguez, Cleo Maridakis and Eloise Lopez and it is hosted by Francisca Elmer, Jenna Contucchio, Florence Menes, Cleo Maridakis, Evelyn Salas, and Paola Diaz. We will be back in two weeks with another exciting guest. The music of the podcast is from the song Them A Pray by Drizzle, the Road Runner, an artist from Roatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music.